perennials are used on the same unit as agricultural crops and or animals. The integration of trees on farms and in the agricultural landscape diversifies and sustains production for increased social, economic, and environmental benefits for the land users particularly. To a smallholder, farmers, and other rural people because it can enhance their food supply, income, and health. Agroforestry systems are multifunctional systems that can provide a wide range of economic, sociocultural, and environmental benefits. They are particularly relevant for the adaptation under the current climate change scenario, as well as in the restoration of degraded landscapes. So our webinar today will be separated in three different segments. In the first segment, we are going to have two presentations. After that, our guests, Laura and Antoine, will introduce themselves and pose a question to the speakers. And in the third segment, we will leave time for questions from the participants. So if you can up with any questions during the presentation, please write them down to ask them in the third segment. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Yeah, my name is Ulwa Shewade Kube, and I'm the head of the CIFOR subcommission. CIFOR is the Center for International Forestry Research, and then uh, from the International Forestry Students Association. We are pleased to have you here join us on this webinar. And then, like uh, my co moderator, Med said, we're going to be having a fun uh, right discussion right now. So, we are going to invite our guests to join us. Uh, thank you for joining. Mates, you can go ahead and invite the guest speakers. Okay. Um, now I would like to introduce our speakers for today, starting with Main Bang Norwick. I don't know if that's uh, the correct pronunciation. He's a distinguished research fellow and agroforestry at the World Agroforestry. For many years, Dr. Main guided the global integration of the Center Science and co-lead ICRAF Global Research Program on Environmental Services. Dr. Main has a PhD in Agricultural Science from the University of Weyneham, the Netherlands. Um, he was published on issues across a wide range of scales from roots interacting the, with soil to global environmental policies and their national implementation. He's currently professor of agroforestry at the Mention University. Dr. Mem, please go ahead and share your presentation with us. Uh, you are muted, so we don't hear you. Okay, that is good. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, there is a lot of rain here, so that's why I had muted, but I need to unmute if I want to be heard by all of you. Yeah, no, um, thank you for the invitation. And indeed, it is a, it is a pleasure to connect with the IFSA group. Um, the connection was made through the Ayufro office in, in Vienna. I've been doing some work with Ayufro on, on a large forest water review uh, two years ago that is still available within the Ayufro channels. It might be interesting for, for some of you. Um, let me, I'm trying to open the file. Yes, <clears throat> so I had, does this work? I had <clears throat> prepared a couple of very simple talking points um, that I also put in a small YouTube thing with a link on the, the Facebook channel. So uh, <clears throat> if people want to follow up, that can be done that way. So a few things, yeah, agroforestry in a nutshell, where does the idea come from? And yeah, might it, 
um, gave a definition, but what does it mean? <clears throat> now, I think to understand agroforestry, um, we need to first think a bit about what is non-agroforestry. Yeah? Uh, 40 years ago, 45 years ago, when, when agroforestry as a word was framed, um, we had a, word, a world within which agriculture and forestry were very different, were occupied very different places in the institutional platform. Um, and I'm afraid that is still partly true right now that forestry students are trained in different ways from agriculture students um, to stay closer to home for, for IFSA. So it was realized though that that strict segregation, the, the Berlin Wall between agriculture and, and forestry was itself causing a lot of problems. Uh, there are problems with with trees, uh, if you look at the FAO definition, some trees are expected to be agricultural trees like rubber or oil palm or coffee or cacao, and other trees are supposed to be forestry trees. Well, well the trees don't know, um, and, and the rubber can be grown for timber and then it suddenly becomes a forestry tree. So it, it is a bit messy to try to maintain a, a strict border between the two parts. And foresters are trained that Farming and farmers are a threat to forest industry and you need to control them. And agriculture, agriculture development saw so trees as, as a bottleneck, as a hindering. Yeah? And, and agriculture development was largely based on removing trees from the landscapes pretty successfully in most of Europe. Um, yeah? And the functions that trees would have in an agricultural context, like maintaining soil fertility, uh, helping with pest control, water management, all that could be replaced by fertilizers and pesticides and, and other inputs. So the, the segregation between agriculture and forestry became stronger and stronger over time. Um, and at the start of agroforestry, you say, well, hey, that that is a problem and that isn't necessary. And like the title of your seminar today, Better Together uh, can apply at, at multiple scales. Yeah, so the first when agroforestry started, it, it was focused on the tropical world for the first couple of decades, although, of course, agroforestry does exist in temperate zone in, in Europe, in, in, in North America, in, in, in temperate China and other parts as, as well as Australia. But the focus has been on the tropical agroforestry for a lot of the time of agroforestry so far. So the first interpretation of agroforestry was, if you, if you look at the Venn diagram with agriculture and forestry, uh, specific technologies that are operated somehow in the interface of agriculture and forestry with uh, definitions requiring that the trees are not there by accident, but are there deliberate, and that the interactions need to be managed in the biophysical world as well as in the economical and social part. So in that first phase, when, when agroforestry started, there was a first phase of, of discovery. Uh, what are all the different agroforestry systems of the world and, and how is coffee agroforestry different from home gardens and what is it, does it have anything in common with alley cropping and whatever. So we got a whole range of terminology, silvo pastoral systems, everything. Try to make sense of, of the huge interface between agriculture and forestry that actually exists. Now on the research site, well, ICRAF was initially formed as a council, not to do research, but to spread the information. Um, and the focus was on this um, diagnose and design, on learning loops, on working closely with farmers with some initial ideas and let farmers sort out a lot of the things themselves for that. Now, after a while, it was clear that, that more research would be useful and, and the research focused on this uh, tree soil crop interactions, the resource capture above ground, below ground, under what conditions would it actually be useful to have trees and crops together, under what condition is it better to have them apart. Yeah, so a lot of the, the biophysical understanding goes back to that first period of, of agroforestry. In the 1990s, we realized that that is not enough, that there is an important part of agroforestry is about the landscape. It is about how 
trees in the landscape, how forest and, and tree elements uh, interact with water flows, with biodiversity agendas. In, in 1992, we had the Rio conventions and, and, and there were, we, were, yeah, we were waking up to the relevance of biodiversity and climate change. And so the idea that landscape scale is the appropriate scale to look at what farmers do, how they manage resources, um, and, and yeah, agroforestry moved, well, the, the plot level part, the, the farms, the markets were still very important, but an important additional part of agroforestry research became focused on the ecosystem services uh, from the biophysical side, from the social side, from the, the economic side, early experiments with payments for ecosystem services um, came all out of that, that work. Um, at the same time, we found that in a lot of places, there were large conflicts between forest and state forestry organizations and farmers, farmers being evicted from landscapes. Um, and yeah, on the institutional side, um, we needed more than we had so far. So that has led to what we now call the third concept of agroforestry. Yeah, and, and if you look at the Venn diagrams in, in the upper right, uh, we, we first had specific things on the interface, then we had the interface between agriculture and forestry, and now we actually say, no, uh, maybe ag agriculture and forestry are better together. Uh, whatever we do, if we develop a specific agroforestry policy, we still have problems with definitions. We actually have two problems of definitions because then we need to say how is agroforestry different from forest? How is agroforestry different from agriculture? So instead of one definitional problem, we now have two. And we are better off with approaching that both agriculture and forestry are about land, they are about livelihoods, they are about ecosystem services, they are about sustainable development goals, and we need to, to operate at that level. Now, a more direct policy interaction became helped by sort of data that if you look the simplest agroforestry definition of trees on farm, yeah, from, from global data, we know more than 40% of agriculture has at least 10% tree cover. Uh, so we are not, not a majority, but an important part of agriculture already has trees within that landscape, within that context. Um, and, and yeah, um, big steps toward the third paradigm were made within the European Union, where uh, definitions, and, and in France was a country where definitions of agroforestry became a very important part. And, and is, it, is it illegal to have trees on agriculture land? Well, first they had to clarify that it, it's not necessarily illegal, that it is possible. And with the current um, agriculture policies, it, it, it is up to the countries to, to decide the details, but basically agroforestry is now accepted as a normal part of land use that, that can provide functions to the farmers as well. So this is in a nutshell, this, this shift within agroforestry from the non-agroforestry world where agriculture and forestry are clearly separated to a focus on specific technologies at the interface towards looking at the whole interface, the agriculture expansion into forest uh, farmers in the forest, trees on farm, trees taking over agriculture, um, to be focused on the interface. And now we say, well, uh, even that is not enough. We need to look at the whole combination of agriculture and forestry as a gradient within which agroforestry can play a useful part. Now, this is in a nutshell the, the history of, of agroforestry as a, as a topic of science, as a topic of research. Uh, we have described it in, in a book. You can look over time. This is from over, by decade how yeah, the balance was between um, focused on, on local knowledge and what actually exists on farms, going back to uh, the, the scientific roots and clarifying more detail what the interactions are. And now very much uh, in a policy arena, trying to make sure that bottlenecks to agroforestry that, that still exist in many of the rules and regulations, that they are <coughs> removed so that it can actually take its, its valid place. And we, we, all, we work on land um, and we want land to be evaluated on its function and on, not on its form. 
At the same time, and that is back to your IFSA, uh, we need to make sure that forestry students and agricultural students are aware of these, these things at the interface and that we break this cultural barrier that has in the past existed between forestry and, and agriculture and create space for a wide array of specific ways that trees can contribute to farm, farmers' livelihoods, can play roles in markets, uh, can play roles in, in, in climate change adaptation, change the microclimate, uh, make climate change less of a threat to farmers, etc. Uh, but that we need to be, at the same time, uh, be aware that trees are quite effective competitors with crops and that if you don't regulate them, uh, you may get into, um, may not achieve what you want to achieve. So we do need research, we do need the knowledge, we do need to take local knowledge seriously. Um, and within a sustainable development goal, both agriculture, forestry and agroforestry have to make sure that it is better together and better together, I think applies to all the three agroforestry concepts. That would be my starting point and hope I'm looking forward to our discussions. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Main. Our second speaker is Joanna Paulo, professor and researcher at ISA. Main research topics cover the understanding and modeling of the effect of climate, soil and ecosystem management practices on tree and cork growth grounded on data from long-term trials and plots located in forest and silvopastoral areas, lectures, agroforestry, mo forest modeling, among others. Also a founding member of the European Agroforestry Federation and currently the national delegate for Portugal. Please go ahead and share your presentation with us. Hello. So first of all, good morning or good afternoon to you all. That clearly depends on which, uh, which side of the world you are. And I see that are, there are many people here from, from different countries. Uh, so I work in, uh, in Portugal, like, uh, like the presenter already said, uh, in uh, the Superior Institute of, uh, of Agronomy. I have, um, I have uh, given the, the title to this presentation of Agroforestry in Europe. How did we get here and how do we, how do we move on? Uh, just to give you a, well, a, an over, a fast overview of, uh, of what, uh, what happened in, uh, in Europe in the last centuries uh, and how it's uh, Euraf uh, trying to change the current uh, status of, uh, of this distinction between agriculture and, and forestry. So like, uh, like we already saw, uh, this, uh, we already saw the, the, the definition for agroforestry. So this, uh, in this slide, you have the definition that was um, accepted and that it's used official by the European Agroforestry Federation. Agroforestry is the integration of trees, crops, and or livestock on the same um, area of land, like we, uh, like we already saw. Uh, and we believe that ag agroforestry systems can be applied uh, in all parts of Europe and of course in also in other in other continents. Uh, agroforestry systems uh, can be obtained, uh, well we, we can say that we can ob obtain them into um, moving in two uh, directions. One by planting trees on agricultural land and then you will get to intercropped orchards or to silvo arable uh, systems like uh, like we have uh, many in, uh, in the Mediterranean uh, and in the North African regions. Uh, or then you can um, obtain agroforestry systems by introducing agriculture in uh, existing woodlands or in existing orchards. And then you'll, you'll be having uh, silvo, silvo pastoral systems. Uh, the, when you mixture the crops and the livestock, usually the, those systems are called mixed farming. And sometimes there is a debate uh, that I'll not go into uh, today uh, if they are agroforestry or if mixed farming systems are, are different. But that, that's not relevant, I think, for, for, for the topic and for the interest um, of, the, of the students that organized this, uh, organized this, uh, this webinar today. 
Um, another issue that sometimes concerns me, it's, it's the amount of time that we take in debating two different aspects. The first one is the tree arrangements. Uh, I call it like a technical issue. We accept that uh, in RAF, we accept that the trees can be inside the parcels uh, in regular or in irregular arrangements and that the, the trees may also not be inside the, the parcels. They, may be, they also can be in the boundaries. Uh, and so we, in those cases, we call them edges. Uh, so this is a technical issue that will uh, take us to the, um, the classification of the different types of agroforestry, but they are all agroforestry and that's, that's our interest and that's our concern is to spread agroforestry no matter what the, the, si what the size of the trees and what the disposition of the tree is at this point. Uh, another, um, another issue is the number of species. Uh, so do we do we have a minimum number of species or a minimum number of tree species uh, in uh, the system in order to call the, that that parcel or that uh, or that land uh, an agroforestry system? And in our in our perspective, no. So what we want is to move uh, away from monocultures, um, monocultures that can be crops uh, or tree species and to, um, to develop agroforestry. And of course we can do that by starting from um, simple uh, agroforestry, simple uh, agroforestry systems where you have one crop and one tree species, for example, alley cropping systems, some, some of them are starting to be implemented in, in Germany or in France, for example, or even the Montado, I don't know, for those of you that are not from the south of Europe or from Europe, Montado is a silvopastoral system or a silvo arable or an agro silvo pastoral system uh, that we have in Portugal, in, in Spain, Italy, that, um, that includes the cork oak, uh, species that produces the, the cork, uh, that's a non uh, forest product that it's uh, considered uh, an agricultural uh, product. It's a very typical agroforestry system in the south of, uh, of Europe. But of course we can, uh, we can increase the number of species and we can move to multi-crop and uh, multi-tree species uh, mixtures. Uh, and at, at, the last, at the last of it, we, we can uh, move in, uh, towards uh, very complex agroforestry systems like the ones that are uh, being researched today called syntropic agriculture based on permaculture uh, techniques, for example. But the main issue here is that what we want is to move away from monocultures and to reintroduce the trees in agricultural system and to re reintroduce the animals into the forest, in the, to the pure uh, forest plantations and to uh, combine them and to optimize the synergies and the, the, the mechanisms uh, that the crops and the trees may develop together. Um, but after all, we, it is true that um, Europe, it's a little bit uh, far behind uh, some other uh, continents and this is in, in the development uh, or in the reintroduction of agroforestry systems. When why is that? Th that you, if you, uh, if you go into history books, you can understand a little bit of what happens in Europe. In Europe, um, until the Middle Ages or even more recently, it was common for you to, for people to remove shrubs and to remove uh, herbaceous vegetation, or even to select some trees to cut and to burn. Um, and then to grow food in those uh, forest areas that were that were cleared. Uh, these cultivation systems, unfortunately, are not currently uh, used. Uh, some of them were maintained, particularly in uh, in the in the south of Europe. Uh, but it is true that uh, during the 20th century, these were. Uh, a little bit excluded. So the trees were started to be seen as uh, not uh, not a good element in the in their and the agricultural land. And on the other way, uh, the agricultural practices and the animals inside the forest were were also not seen as a um, as a positive aspect. Uh, so. We must also remember the first and the second world war where a new social paradigm appeared. After the, these two big world wars, Europe had to uh, feed uh, a population. It was uh, the, the, the countries that participated in these world wars 
were facing many uh, problems. And so there was this need to increase agricultural production. And there was also uh, in the 19th and the 20th century, an increase in the machinery power in the, in the ability of producing fertilizers and chemicals. And uh, like, the, like it was uh, already said by the, by the previous speaker, uh, this gave people the, the feeling that they could take trees out of the agricultural land uh, they could take animals out because they would not need the fertilization of the animals or the effect uh, the, the, of the fertilizers of the leaves of the trees uh, on the agricultural land or in the forest. So uh, this was the moment where we started to look at things separately and we started to divide the land either if we wanted to focus on uh, forest, uh, forestry or in agricultural land. But this had consequences and we are until now uh, observing those consequences in Europe. So European agroforestry systems were converted uh, into areas dedicated mainly to, uh, to intensive and extensive practices uh, or um, even the, to land abandonment more recently in some regions uh, of Europe and also associated to, uh, to some inadequate policy measures. Uh, in education, this was the moment where we started um, separating the agriculture and the forestry education and scientific areas. For example, here in my, uh, in my university, uh, around the, the 70s, it was the, the time where the, forest, the foresters were able and they, they were very happy at that moment because they were able to create specific courses for um, a, a, an independent course for, um, for forestry. Because until that moment, forestry was lectured together uh, with agriculture. But it was uh, at that moment that was, that was observed as uh, a big uh, independency uh, for people interested and for people working uh, in, uh, in forestry. Uh, in the land, uh, what we saw was an increase of the tree removal from the, from the farmland and an animal removal from the forest. Uh, and this was also seen as important. And uh, around those decades, uh, it, was, uh, it was promoted to remove the animals from the forest because they were seen as uh, issues if you wanted to promote natural regeneration of, uh, of the forests. So, Actually, what we what we saw in Europe in this uh, in this last century, more or less, was a disappearing of traditional systems that we are now trying to well rediscover. And I can uh, and I can uh, list uh, some uh, of them that I'm working with, and I think that are particularly uh, interesting. And I have put here some links if you want to read a little bit more about them. Uh, one of them is the hanged. Uh, vineyards. They existed in France, Portugal, Italy, Spain, Spain in the south of uh, Europe uh, until until the the 19th centuries. But they have been almost wiped out from from Europe. Until uh, now, these days, uh, you can only see very small areas of these hanged vineyards. These hanged vineyards is where so you have the the vineyards producing the the, the wine and the and, and the grapes but they are traditional uh, varieties of, uh, of vineyards that have the potential to grow very high, climbing uh, on uh, trees. Uh, trees that may be, for example, popular or other uh, species that are grown, and they are not grown for, for the wood. They are grown uh, for, um, for you to take the leaves uh, in order to feed the animals. These systems usually are, um, are maintained uh, in the boundaries of agricultural parcels. So what you what you have here, it's a, a use uh, of the trees in order to promote the vineyard and uh, a multiple use of the trees because you are also using it to feed uh, your animals and you are protecting the agricultural crops that are inside the, the parcel. Uh, you only, this is, uh, we only have this in Portugal in a very, very large, uh, very, very small um, land uh, area at this moment. We have a project where we are um, monitorizing and uh, 
putting them all of the areas that exist and uh, now in, in this system in a in a digital maps uh, and they are very very interesting systems that we are trying to protect because what is happening now is that the european policies are promoting the intensive uh, vineyards and people are substituting uh, wine production in vineyards on these systems by uh, intensive ones uh, other traditional systems the intercropped vineyards uh, so the mixture of um, vineyards and olives with fruit trees and even with uh, horticulture this is also another system that it's uh, basically very located in very interior par parts of the of rural areas and intercropped uh, multi-species orchards with uh, horticulture for example in in france and in belgium you still ha you now have some people um, introducing this uh, these systems again because they were already uh, disappeared uh, in the last uh, century uh, so if we look at uh, at europe and you can uh, have a look at this uh, at this uh, paper if you are interested um, later on you have here the the, ref the full references so you can easily uh, get it uh, currently agroforestry systems cover only three 0.6 um, percentage of the European uh, area, and this re uh, refers to 8.8 percent of the agricultural land. So it's really a quite small uh, percentage uh, of the of the area. Uh, th so there is this huge potential in Europe for the regrow uh, of agroforestry landscapes and agroforestry farms and agro and agroforestry parcels. And we see this uh, from uh, in, in several research. For example, in this uh, in this work, uh, it was estimated that we could increase 56% uh, of the area of Juglans, Prunus, Popular, Pinus Pinia, Quercus ilex, uh, in uh, in Europe, if we uh, introduced these three species into silvopastoral uh, systems that are now covered only by agricultural land. Uh, and, for example, in Portugal, I spoke, I told you about Corco because that's the that's uh, the Montado and the Corco. It's my main uh, research uh, topic at this point, and we have also estimated that if we took arable land and we introduced the Corco in, and transformed it into silvo arable systems in Portugal, this would uh, increase uh, largely the, the the amount of hectares and the amount of area of silvo arable systems in in Portugal. So uh, we, we really believe that in Europe and in, in many institutions, we really believe that this is possible and that we must do this regrowth of agroforestry systems in Europe because um, agroforestry system due to the joint presence of trees, animals or crops have demonstrated clearly um, that economic, environmental and social benefits can, uh, can, be, uh, can be achieved. Uh, for example, if you if you can if you consider the accumulated amount of energy that um, agroforestry systems can uh, achieve, and if you compare them to agriculture um, and to forestry systems, monocropped agriculture and forestry systems, like we did in this uh, PhD uh, work from from the students, uh, we compared it in four different uh, um, agroforestry systems: the Montado in Portugal, the Orchard in Switzerland, alley cropping uh, in the UK, uh, and this is covered. And short rotation coppices in in Germany. Of course, there are differences uh, between these four systems, but what you see is that in all of them, all of them accumulate uh, more energy than the pure, the monocropped uh, systems that they were compared to. So uh, this traduces not only in, into benefits uh, from, uh, from an ecological point of view, but also from an economic point of view. And so this is also uh, one, of our, one, of our, one of the points where we are working at this point is to demonstrate to, to farmers, to stakeholders, that the, that all of the society benefits from the introduction of agroforestry system from an ecological point of view, uh, and that also uh, from an economic point of view they can benefit. So if you look if you look at the land equivalent ratio values that are associated to agroforestry systems, we there are many um, work 
many scientific research papers in the literature where you can see that the land equivalent ratios are higher to one uh, when the, the agroforestry systems are compared to, to monoculture. So what, what, what is happening? What is happening in Europe at, at, this, uh, at this moment? In the previous presentation, it was funny, I, I saw the, the years uh, of the three phases uh, that, was, that were demonstrated. And IURAF comes uh, at the beginning of the third one. IURAF appears in 2011. It is constitu it constituted in 2011. So like you can see, uh, Europe is uh, waking up um, later than other countries for this, uh, for this agroforestry, for the importance of agroforestry and for the need to reintroduce agroforestry. But it is waking up. Uh, what can what are we doing and what can we do now? Uh, first of all, adequate support and incentive uh, policies. Until now, uh, European policies uh, have been not paying quite uh, the, the the attention that is needed to agroforestry. It is uh, they are moving in the right direction, still slowly. There is still much much uh, need to to improvement but you uh, one of the one of the topics where Raf is working is on uh, policy uh, policy lobbying in the European uh, Commission uh, another important uh, topic for us to to move forward with agroforestry is research and knowledge transfer yes we we cannot only mixture the species. We must understand how they interact with each other, how they interact with the soil, how they, uh, how they affect uh, water cycles, how they affect nutrient cycles. If we want to maximize the interaction of animals, trees and crops, we must invest in research and of course also in knowledge transfer. The research cannot be um, only closed into papers, it must, in scientific papers, it must reach out to, uh, to farmers and it must reach out to students, uh, like, uh, like IFSA students. Uh, in, the last, um, in the last 20 years, like you can see here, I have a list of the projects that were specifically dedicated uh, in Europe, funded by European um, projects. Um, that were specifically dedicated to agroforestry systems. You can have a look at them. All of them have the website still very active. All of them have many interesting uh, knowledge transfer material, especially the AgForward and the Affinet projects. They were they had a very specific knowledge transfer uh, work package, and the Affinet project, for example, was particularly dedicated to knowledge transfer. So, you, you if you are interested, you can have a look. Uh, at the, the materials that they, they present. And currently there are two projects recently financed and recently started. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, they are the mixed project and the, the agro mixed uh, project and you can uh, also have a look. Um, and we are also very concerned, not the last, but uh, I, I think that uh, the, the most important uh, topic to promote agroforestry is education we must move away from such a separation between agricultural students, agricultural topics and forestry uh, topics. Uh, if, you, if you have a look at the number of masters um, that exist in Europe on agroforestry, it's a very uh, low number. Uh, I only know two uh, masters that are particularly dedicated to, to agroforestry. We now have in URAF, uh, we are engaged and we are participating in a, in a master program that's called the MED4 uh, master program that it's not particularly dedicated, it's a forestry master, it's not de particularly dedicated to, to agroforestry, but where URAF has a participation, uh, so where we have the possibility of people, of master students to be working with URAF and in the agroforestry uh, topics. So this is our main concern, policy, research and knowledge transfer. URAF, it's not 
Uh, it's not dedicated, it's not an institution that it's not a research institution, but it does want to collaborate with um, research institution in order to promote knowledge transfer and in order to promote education in agroforestry. That's that's our main goal because we really want to, we really believe that uh, on the advantages of agriculture and on the advantages of mixing the trees, the crops and the animals. This, this, uh, this nice picture that I like so much misses the animals. I must take time to add some animals to, the, to this picture when I, when I have the time. So thank you again. Thank you very much for your invitation and looking forward for the, for the debate stage. Thank you very much, Johanna, for your inputs. That was a beautiful presentation. Uh, so now we are going to have our second moment. Our guests, we have Tuan and Laura, to introduce themselves and start a moment of discussion between themselves. And then I would like you, Tuan and Laura, to ask that you don't stay too long on the answers because after this moment, we'll hold ourselves to questions that we have from all uh, from everyone watching us from all around the world. So Tuan and Laura, you can start. Um, Tuan, you can start and then Laura will continue with the discussion. Tuan, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you for, for this very nice presentation on agroforestry. Uh, first, I introduce myself. So I'm, I'm Tuan and um, I'm working on the agroforestry system in the Northwest of Vietnam, where we are planting um, like uh, coffee trees. And they are under like a legume uh, kind of trees, you know, those trees that are uh, uh, enriched soil with nitrogen. And so in, inside this uh, agroforestry system, we uh, created three water treatments, like one, one part where we irrigated the coffee trees and one, one part where we water suppressed uh, the water from, from the rain. So like we have like uh, plastic sheets on the, on the ground where the water would get pulled down and then go out of the system. And then we also have a one part with it, which is rain fed. So the idea is to compare like uh, the production of the coffee under this system and uh, with the different water treatments. And we also have like, um, like uh, some machines to measure the transpiration. So the water flow inside the coffee tree, like two needles that we put inside the trunk of the coffee tree. And then we, we look at uh, how, 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 how much water is going out of this tree. And so the idea is to, to see like the water efficiency of the coffee tree and to compare uh, this efficiency in different uh, water treatments along with, uh, with the shade trees. Um, so as I'm doing in the Northwest, and um, I, think, I think I will wait for everybody, everybody's question uh, later at the end. And I will uh, give the, the mic to Laura so she can continue on that. Laura, if you want to, to give, introduce yourself. All right, so can you hear me? Can you see me? Okay, I cannot see myself, but that is not a problem. Yes, Laura, right, we can uh, hear Great. Great. All right, uh, warm greetings from Germany to our speakers, fellow panelists, and all those joining the live stream today or watching the recording later. Uh, I want to first thank our ISTA representatives for putting this together. Um, and a quick introduction about myself and why I'm joining you today. Uh, so my name is Laura Deal. I am an interdisciplinary social science researcher with Trans Sustain at the University of Münster, where I also completed a Master of National and Transnational Studies in September 2019, and previously earned a bachelor's degree in international studies from Seattle University. Prior to Germany, I lived in Indonesia, where I worked as a science writer and social media strategist for C4, and for the Global Landscape Forum. Uh, it was there where I became really interested in both indigenous rights and agroforestry. Uh, working with foresters representing a wide variety of disciplines and geographies over the course of two years, it became impossible not to notice certain patterns in their research. Uh, one, often sustainability outcomes were improved when communities themselves had greater decision-making power over land and resource use. Uh, Second, multi-storied agroforestry systems support more biodiversity and reduce erosion, amongst other benefits. And the traditional environmental knowledge, or TEK, of indigenous peoples can offer valuable insights into how these agroforestry systems might work best in their respective landscapes. 
It's also often these indigenous peoples who, at great personal risk, have spearheaded efforts to foreground mixed use landscapes as a response to our overlapping climate and sustainability crises. Oh, now I'm getting a message saying that uh, my audio is not coming in very well. Can, can people hear me? Is it working fine? Okay. All right. And uh, third, uh, increased incomes do not necessarily translate into improved livelihoods for many rural communities. Now, in 2008, while working on my master's degree here in Germany, I joined Transsustain. And our work focuses on analyzing the efficacy of sustainability certifications like Rainforest Alliance, Fair Trade, or IFOM Organics for Latin American coffee farmers. Um, while working with them, I became interested in whether and how these certifications can contribute to a shift in production towards agroforestry systems. Uh, certifications are often referred to as a form of non state market governance. And it is in this that they have their greatest strength. As voluntary measures, they allow producers to opt in to regulations that are above and beyond the requirements of a given country. And as market mechanisms, they circumvent the often slow and cumbersome processes that characterize legislative change. Thus, they have been integrated into existing agricultural systems and market structures extremely rapidly. Uh, today, it's estimated that approximately half of all coffee is cultivated under at least one sustainability certification. Uh, further, half of all money invested in sustainable coffee production annually is financed through these certifications, and adoption rates continue to rise. Their prevalence makes them either a key ally or a key obstacle to widespread changes in the coffee sector in transitioning to agroforestry. Um, yet the coffee industry is in dire straits. And one study published in 2018 estimated that when accounting for the combined loss of pollinator services, uh -huh. um, I'm sorry, I'm being distracted by messages about whether or not you guys can hear me. Um, all right, up to 88% of current coffee growing lands in Latin America could be lost by 2050. Needless to say, this would be devastating for millions of smallholder farmers. Um, but agroforestry promises to correct a lot of these really negative trends. Um, two pests and diseases that threaten the coffee industry, the coffee rust disease and the coffee berry borer, um, are both lessened in dramatic uh, negative effects when introduced in agroforestry systems. Um, in the case of coffee rust disease in monoculture, the most common false and robust varietal is highly vulnerable to rust when packed tightly together in rows. And with the coffee berry borer, um, the natural predators, especially birds, uh, that find habitats in multi storied agroforestry landscapes, uh, have no place to live in monocultures and therefore the, the pests can spread more rapidly. Uh, there's a, a growing body of evidence that agroforestry appears to be the most sustainable way to produce coffee, and yet uh, it is not even close to becoming the, the dominant production system. Um, so my research interests really focus on how can we make these certifications, which are growing in prevalence and importance, especially as a form of governance, uh, more, amenable, more amenable to agroforestry systems. I'm going to summarize and cut this short because I'm getting too many messages about uh, audio quality being problems. So for the sake of time and your ears, um, I will close with, uh, in my research, my field research in Colombia with indigenous coffee farmers, um, I found that for many coffee farmers, even when they do desire to transition to an agroforestry system, uh, diversifying their livelihoods has become structurally impossible. Most smallholders pursue certification for the promise of better incomes for their products. And they usually hold such small parcels of land that in order to pay the cost of certification, they have no choice but to devote all of their land to coffee production in the conventional monoculture manner. Most are also living in poverty with many households experiencing food insecurity for a few months every year. There's simply no money with which to rehabilitate their degraded lands and invest in agroforestry, even if it would improve their livelihoods in the long term. Um, 
many farmers are already in debt to national banks or financiers for previous rehabilitations on their land. Many certifications suggest that producers diversify their livelihood, but they have little incentive to make this a requirement to participation or to invest in it directly. Indeed, only one certification, Bird Friendly, explicitly requires that coffee be grown in agroforestry systems. Yet it appears that certifications are here to stay for the foreseeable future, and their requirements and norms have a major influence on the way these landscapes are used worldwide. Um, while I'm most familiar with these challenges in coffee, many tropical commodities and the smallholders who produce them are facing similar challenges. Education and the benefits of agroforestry systems is simply not enough. Most producers cannot finance the transition themselves, and most organizations which often provide this finance, such as government, certification programs, and international aid organizations, are as interested in maintaining a consistent world supply of goods as maintaining local benefits on the ground. So my question to both of our speakers is a broad one. Who should be responsible for making the transition to agroforestry economically and socially feasible for producers to globally critical commodities? And how can we maintain a focus on the utilization and prioritization of local knowledge in the process? Thank you. And I will hand us back over to our facility. Uh, Laura Antoine. Joanna, you were the second to present, so you can go first and, ask, and answer the question. Maine, you can go and answer after Joanna, please. Well, that, that's, that's a very hard question. Uh, it's more of a political question, I would say. I, I don't think that it's a single answer. I really think that depends on the country or on the continent. So for sure, um, well, I, I have been in Costa Rica and I have been, um, so that's where, that, that's the only knowledge about agroforestry with coffee that I, that I have. Uh, but I would say that the answer to your question, it's different if it's um, on, uh, on Africa or if it's in, uh, or if it's in uh, Europe. So uh, my knowledge is limited, so I, will do, I would only dare to answer uh, in the case of Europe. In the case of, uh, in the case of Europe, if we are considering your description of small uh, farmers, uh, and we do have that situation in some rural areas um, uh, that are usually poor uh, areas, uh, I would say that the, the, the idea is for the European, uh, the, the European Commission, the European policies to support uh, at least the beginning of that transition. I'm, what I'm saying is that I think that's the more or less uh, idea. I am not saying that that's on the agreement uh, of all. Um, so well, I, I'll consider if I'll if I'll answer uh, again <laughs> a little bit more uh, further. But uh, in in the for sure in the outside the European Union, for sure the answer uh, would be maybe would be different. So I don't think there is one single answer for the whole uh, world. Okay, let me <coughs> pick up. There is a bit of uh, <coughs> sound coming from the surrounding here. I, I hope it doesn't disturb you. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the, the question who should be responsible is, I think, first of all, um, we need a level playing field uh, as, as both the, the, the story on Europe that Joanna talked about and what we've seen elsewhere is for a long time. There was a negative bias against agroforestry, against trees on farm, etc. Uh, we don't want to go overboard and say that everyone should now planting trees, etc. It, it, it is an option that should should have a fair chance, and it should be based on on farmers themselves and 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 on the people downstream, whether they benefit from or don't benefit from, um, and for the government. Is it? Um, now it is okay. 
Yeah. And so the, the yeah, the, the three layers, the farm level, the landscape level, the overall policy level, at each level we need to look at is it are there net benefits of not? Is it better together or is it not better together? And, and for certain things, the answer is it's not better together. Uh, and for others, it is. So we, we first of all want a fair, a fair game, a level playing field. And we, we've come out of a history that that wasn't the case at all. So we have to be yeah, some advocacy where we can complete. And specifically on coffee, we were involved in, in, in a landscape in Indonesia that was at that time one of the hottest conflicts, large numbers of people were evicted from a watershed uh, because of hydropower development there and, and farmers developing coffee and, and foresters being convinced that coffee was their enemy and that coffee farmers shouldn't be allowed to be there at all. Um, and with the research, we could show that if you actually measure what happens with water, uh, yeah, coffee farms are actually have more water coming out than uh, a dense plantation of, of replanted forest. Um, and it is a matter of what type of coffee and how you manage, but there was a lot of space for reconciliation. There was a lot of things that were much better for everybody's perspective once we could open up, open up that these things can exist. Our earlier economic analysis had shown that the multi-strata coffee with fruit trees and, and, and some high value timber were actually more profitable, but you need some time to get there. The farmers were in sort of a, a monoculture mode that had more problems with erosion and, and runoff uh, because of uncertainty. So creating stability, creating certainty was a main step towards solving problems. Yeah. So yeah, there is a lot of space for uh, looking at situations one carefully and then finding that, that we have missed as a society, we have missed opportunities by uh, thinking that forestry and agriculture should be managed separately. Um, a different example is in Indonesia, we had for a long time that all trees, you need permits to cut or transport any tree in the country, supposedly to protect the forest. But um, we realized long time ago that it was also applied to trees that really are not threatened in the forest. Um, and, and since these, a, a number of trees were deregulated and, and, and Paraserianthes or Sangon is one of the first one, and we now see a thriving business of growing these trees on farm in the coffee gardens and elsewhere uh, and, and being free from all the red tape and all the permits and all the corruption that comes with that. Um, so yeah, there is a lot of space for doing a lot better than uh, keeping agriculture and forestry separate the way it has been done for a long time. And I think that that is our challenge, not not to make sure that everyone is now become belongs to the religion of agroforestry and thinks that that is the only solution everywhere. No, but we want to give it a fair chance, and and we want students to to yeah to get out of these these narrow boxes and 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 be able to contribute to uh, the types of problems we have uh, with climate change and biodiversity loss and yet we need more food production and and etc 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 we can't sort these things in boxes first and, and then look for solutions then we will miss a lot of opportunities thank you i'd like to add on, on this question uh, i have in the northwest where, where i'm working with coffee i saw that farmers uh, often want like to have a uh, new seedlings like a fruit trees or timber trees uh, because for them it's uh, an income and it's also a way to protect the, the coffee trees and get the frost get the frost but in many cases they don't have access to the seedling or they don't know where to get them they don't they don't really know how to manage them neither so i think it's a big they need a they need a big assistance from like extensions uh, offices from governments um, also funding from governments or projects to to get those uh, the seedlings and uh, it's something the, the government in the Northwest is working on. They really want to, to improve like the agroforestry coverage for coffee and also the, the quality of the coffee. So this goes together usually. Agroforestry for coffee is usually good for, for the quality. And um, they, so they, they try to develop projects, look for fundings. And, um, and I hope in the future that they will be able to like increase the area of agroforestry in the Northwest of Vietnam. I will continue with the second question. So we have a second question before we, we give the, 
the like the the voice to the the audience and the second question is um a, like a recently a study by biodiversity international uh, estimated that uh, 12 crops and five animal species provided around uh, 75 percent of the world food supplies also almost one in every seven plant species who is important for the human diet is at risk of disappearing how can agroforestry system tackle this problem which may threaten food security in the future and also achieve the sustainable development goal 2.5 which aims to maintain the genetic diversity of seeds cultivated plants and farm and domesticated animals and their related wild species so i think maybe minor you, you can start answering and then we ask joanna yeah thank you no uh, a very relevant question and, and indeed um, interesting enough when i joined ecraf uh, there was still this strong sense that yes, we, we, we can and we should improve trees like in forestry. Uh, I mean, the counterpart would be for forestry that, that almost all the tree improvement is focused on, on just a few species, on, on a few um, conifers and, and, and poplar, and, and, and those are the trees foresters work on and, and, and not all the other, <laughs> other species around. Uh, so there was a strong move in agroforestry. We need to prioritize, we need to find out, we can't help to improve quality of seed for all the species of trees, we need to see which ones are the most important. Um, and yeah, in, in many of the African landscapes where that worked, yes, uh, between five and 10 tree species, you, you, you sort of have the <laughs> what you find on farms. When we started looking at those data for, for Indonesia and, 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 and part of Vietnam would be similar in Thailand, yeah, you find that <clears throat> there are 100 species and, and there are up to, to and in some surveys we find up to, to 800 species that we can actually find uh, on farm that, that often establish themselves but are tolerated by farmers or sometimes promoted and sometimes give useful product. So um, at the moment there is, is an African orphan crop consortium operating in, in Nairobi with on, on the ICRAF campus but with many universities in Africa that tries to look, tries to, well, they made a list of 100 trees for which we want to have the full genomic information and try to promote networks of tree breeders that would, would look at, at many of them. Um, and yes, they, of course, they are not, not all equal and not equally important and not, uh, but, but this whole question of um, can and should we focus in agroforestry on just a few species or should we really take diversity seriously and, and work on that. And, and I think part of the work, part of the reason to do this more fundamental work on tree architecture versus function is that we don't want to get stuck on is this eucalyptus or is it is that a good tree or a bad tree? No, it, it can be a good tree, it can be a bad tree. It depends on what you want and where. Um, but ultimately it's a matter of root systems and it's a matter of stems and, and foliage and phenology and, and properties that that can apply to any tree anywhere in the world. Um, and, and we need to develop a science that is not limited to species X and species Y, but that is generic in its understanding of resource capture above ground, below ground, um, and is able to translate that to, to any tree anywhere <laughs> if you want to. Uh, so yeah, uh, clearly on terms of the, the crops, a lot of the traditional crops and tuber crops and others are much more shade tolerant than, than current. A lot of the crop selection has been to, to reduce shade tolerance. So a lot of the modern varieties are less suitable for agroforestry than the traditional ones. Had been interesting work in Nepal, for example, that, that made that point. And even in coffee, we've seen the last decades, the focus was on sun coffee open systems and all the selection was for increased productivity there. Once we change that, and, and say not a priori, it should be a monoculture in the open, but a priori we want to improve the tree for the systems in which they can operate. Then shade tolerance in crops is actually a relevant property that can be understood and can be selected for. So yes, I, I fully agree with, with one, um, that the, the, the loss of diversity in our agricultural systems is a major problem. Agroforestry can on the tree side and um, yeah, promote and stimulate that, that it is, we have many different trees that can all play useful roles in local context. And on the <coughs> food crop side, 
Uh, yeah, let's take, make sure that shade tolerance is not selected out and selected against, and that selection is best done on farm and in the environment in which we want these trees to function. And the whole idea that tree domestication would be something that the research stations do and they sort it out and, and then they come with improved trees. No, uh, the whole current work on tree domestication is with farmers and, and on farm uh, and, and blending farmer knowledge with, with what scientists can understand and see on that. So yes, tree diversity, it, it is an important topic and there are a lot of opportunities there. Uh, and very exciting research at the same time, things that, that can help to, to keep the world more diverse and to counter this trend that, that you noted. Thank you. So jo Joanna, I think you can go on with your answer as well. Thank you. Well, I think Main already gave a perfect answer. Agroforestry is crucial to maintain biodiversity and uh, to increase the number of species that are used by farmers. Uh, crop species, tree species, and even when we are speaking about animals, animal breeds are also very, uh, traditional animal breeds are also very important and agroforestry plays a, a relevant role in uh, maintaining, in, a, in um, stimulating the uses of traditional breeds also. And we must also consider that the potential of the species that we don't actually know very well, or the species that for decades have been set aside uh, under all of this uh, biotechnology development we must also remember that if we don't know those species very well because for a given reason they were more or less set aside they can have a, a crucial uh, potential and a crucial role for the development of products and of services that we actually don't know uh, at this point uh, so, well, that would be my, my, my comment. Yes, uh, agroforestry, it's crucial for the, maintain, for the maintenance of biodiversity and for the protection of, uh, of, uh, of some species and uh, of some breeds uh, all around the world. Thank you so much for your excellent input and discussion. And then for the questions were answered. And now we are going to open the floor for everyone that has questions. We have some questions already in the in the chats, and uh, <laughs> I would like to call. Would you like to post your question yourself, or you just want me to read aloud for you, Delia? Okay, um, I will just take it up. Um, we have one question from John Adnunga. He said that in Ethiopia, such like of agroforestry was carried out by uneducated farmers of indigenous. So without technologies and capitals, the products and yield obtained from missing farms was not promising one. How such country may, might, may boost up the products or services gained from such missing farms? Now he's asking if how countries like Ethiopia where um, uneducated farmers uh, of indigenous communities carry out agroforestry. How can they boost up the products and services they have from missed farmings? Um, I think Joanna would like you to take this up. I'm sorry, I did not understood correctly the question because the sound was breaking. You were reading it, but I, I, I was. It was not possible for me to understand the question. Okay, um, John, would you like to read the question? Can you hear me now? I can read it, I think. In Ethiopia, such like of agroforestry was carried out by unlocated farmers of indigenous. So without technologies at capitals, the products and yields obtained from mixing farms was not promising one. How such countries might boost up the products or services gained from such mixing farms. Did you hear me well? I, I, I read it also very slowly in order to, to, 
Well, uh, I would say that um, first of all, if this, if it was, if in a particular case you you did not had a success why implementing um, a, a given mixture or a given agroforestry system, you must go and have a look again to on education and on scientific knowledge. Uh, the, the question here speaks about uneducated farmers uh, of indigenous. So I would say that one main uh, aspect is the education of the people uh, that are implementing it. Of course, the technologies and I don't really understand what capitals means if it's um, money or whatever, but um, of course the technologies and uh, are also uh, relevant in order to promote the success of the implementation. But in, in my perspective, education, uh, it's crucial to, to increase the success of such and to increase the um, well, the success of such experiments in in Ethiopia and in other countries. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> May I yeah. you can speak? Yes. Yes. Let me try to add some comments. Um, yeah, I, I I think we need to be a bit careful in in the terminology of indigenous being uneducated and etc. Of course, indigenous systems have very rich traditions in knowledge in many cases. At the same time, their way of transferring that to other generations is, is not necessarily the same way as we have with schools and other part. Um, but I think it is a safe assumption that if you actually start looking at what people do, uh, it, it often makes a lot of sense once you start to take it serious. Um, at the same time, the level of knowledge that you need to manage systems depends very much on the environment. Um, just an anecdote there, uh, we, we were working with in the University of Bangor in, in Wales. They have developed systems to really tease apart local knowledge and, and to describe it in detail and see the logic behind. And they had so far applied that in Nepal and found that in relatively simple systems, farmers had a very detailed knowledge about the leaves of trees and what it means for drip sizes and for erosion, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a very rich knowledge on very simple systems. So then we talked and we said, well, we have these rubber agroforestry systems with hundreds of trees. There must be an amazing amount of knowledge to manage those. And, and when we start describing that in detail, we found actually not. And actually you don't need, you can manage complex systems with very simple rules about if it if it comes by itself, uh, well, let it go if it doesn't hurt, if it doesn't disturb another tree, and um, relatively simple systems about space and concept. And, and yes, they knew that the durian tree that they like best is quite competitive. So if it grows on the wrong place, they would remove it. Um, and, and so they were managing based on resource capture but actually relatively simple rules allow them to manage very complex systems quite effectively. And actually economic terms, at least as effective as the monoculture plantations that uh, research had been promoting for a long period of time. So I would be careful with the judgment that uneducated, they, they don't know or they don't know what they're doing. I'd like to take that serious and, and, and delve into it. And, and some of the work I've seen of the the long-term agroforest in, in Ethiopia, both in the coffee and in the, the Nseta domain shows that there is actually very rich and useful knowledge within them. So I'd like to challenge the person who asked the question to, to go there and, and have a closer look at it and report back to us what you find. Thank you. Thank you for your answers. <laughs> we appreciate that. And uh, we have another question here from Delia. I don't know if you can hear me now. Okay. Delia says, as forestry students, do you think the whole facet of agroforestry is sufficiently covered in the forestry curriculum? If not, would IFSA be able to influence the change in the situation? I don't know if anybody can answer this. <laughs> Mm 
Well, yeah, Joanna, would you like to go? Okay, yeah. okay. No, it please is, go ahead. It is a question for IFSA. So. <laughs> the question is to you. <laughs> I had written below that uh, I, I, I think it's a very nice question. <laughs> 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 All right. So um, do you think that the whole facet of agroforestry is sufficiently covered in the forestry curriculums in schools? Um, probably in Europe and then across the world. Maybe Laura and Duan can answer that. Okay, I think Laura will help us answer the question. Laura? The question about agroforestry in the forestry curriculum or the question about uh, indigenous farmers and low productivity problems? No, we want to, the question is about if agroforestry, can you hear me now? Ah. Okay. Um, yeah. Do you think so the whole facet of uh, of agroforestry is sufficiently covered in the forestry curriculum? And if not, do you think the IFSA organization like IFSA would help influence this change in situation? So I can't speak in any particularly meaningful depth specifically to uh, forestry curriculums at different universities worldwide, as I. I'm not a forester in background myself. I'm a social science researcher. Um, but what I will say before tossing the mic to Swan is that I believe that uh, higher education systems in particular and education systems more generally uh, don't do a sufficient job in helping the average citizen understand agricultural systems in general at all and i think um in order to facilitate a transition to agroforestry and the union of agriculture and forestry sciences and conservation and climate protection measures um the not not just those who are directly involved with boots on the ground but the average citizen has to develop a much more robust understanding of where the food products and you know, physical materials of our daily lives really come from. And I hope that IFSA will be a key player in leading that charge. Yes, um, most IFSA members are watching from around the world and they can hear this. Yes, I also hope that we'll be a key player <laughs> in this. And Tuan, do you want to add anything to what Laura said? Yeah, I'd like, um... I, I like to add, uh, I agree with Laura that we don't have much uh, uh, like much agroforestry in the curriculum. It's more either agriculture or either forestry because usually departments at university are separated like this. Um, as far as the IFSA role in changing this, I think um, we, we could try to do some lobbying in policies in our universities and ask for, for more like uh, courses about agroforestry. Uh, or more courses about ecology, agroecology, or those kind of, of uh, new ideas. Um, in IFSA, in 2018, uh, we also did a, a deforestation course online, kind of a, a small course of uh, maybe 20 minutes about deforestation and what are the causes and consequences, etc. And I think IFSA could also do those kind of initiatives, creating their own courses about maybe agroforestry and, and the benefits of trees on the agricultural lands. Um, in, uh, I know in Asia Pacific, we also have an initiative where we look for uh, diversity of trees in, in the cities. So we asked for IFSA members or students uh, in IFSA or in forestry universities to take photos and get the name of the trees next to their, their house or in the city where they live. So we get a, a nice uh, list of uh, different trees in different areas. And this could also be, be done by IFSA and maybe raising awareness about uh, the trees on the agricultural lands and maybe get a, a, get a list of the diversity we, we have per country uh, on the land. So just giving ideas, yeah, <laughs> thank you. 
So thank you, Tuan. That is a wonderful uh, contribution. And just like well, I said, we have so many. Oh, Joanna, you can you can you can speak. Well, um, I think that uh, this is my well my. I'm giving an idea to to Ifsa. If you organized this uh, this webinar and congratulations for it, I really think that you should uh, after the webinar considering consider how you can uh, help uh, the promotion of agroforestry uh, inside the curriculums. At this point, and I'm saying this because here, for for instance, in uh, in ISA, so this is a Superior Institute of Agronomy, uh, the um, the two topics, the agricultural topics, the animal production uh, topics and the forestry, like like in many other institutions, are very set uh, aside. But there is this movement of students um, interested uh, around agroforestry. And what they had done is that they wrote a letter asking for the increase uh, of the um, of the approach on these topics uh, in the in the courses and this small um, movement uh, from students have um, have been taken into consideration now in the revision of the curriculums and so we are now uh, creating a new discipline um, focused on on agroforestry we are uh, developing courses for PhD students also on the topic so it it, it is interesting and uh, it is my uh, I, I would like to reinforce the importance of, of IFSA and of uh, the students, the students approach on this to, to contribute for the increased uh, awareness about the importance of approaching the, the three areas and the three areas, not forgetting also the, the animal component. So that's, that's your homework mm. <laughs> task, I'd say, <laughs> after, the, after the webinar. Thank you, Joanna. We've taken note of that and we're going to work on Next. Mm -hmm. And then we have another question here for the speakers uh, from Tunde Ojelade. He said um, he's talking about the contamination of environments and talking about the soil and the water bodies. That this has been a major concern in the world due to various agricultural and forestry activities, mm -hmm. <laughs> such as the application of fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides. Is there any practices or agroforestry practices that can be adopted to reduce or eliminate such contamination on our Greek land? and or water bodies due to leaching or runoff. Um, <laughs> who would like to take this? Uh, I think I'll call on Menia to take this. Yeah, well, <clears throat> sorry. There is, is of course a large amount of research on that. And, and at the same time, the, the findings depend very much on the, on the situation. It is very clear that um, trees and tree-based systems help in a number of ways. Uh, a very important part is of course the litter, litter layer uh, and typically in agroforestry systems you see litter on the ground for most of the year and that does protect the soil and plays many roles and when you go to, to open field agriculture um, you often find a lot of bare soil and a lot of soil that is prone to erosion and others. Um, there is, uh, we, can, we, we have done work on yeah, how trees stabilize slopes and how we reduce risk for landslides and others. Uh, that is a mixed message. It, of course, it, it, these roots can help in the topsoil. They don't protect you from deep, deep landslides. Uh, but there is, ro there is real roles of, of tree-based vegetation on most aspects of, of erosion and soil movement. On the, the nutrient side, uh, yes, um, Trees generally have more buffer and, and can help. At the same time, the expectation that uh, a few rows of trees along the river would protect and take out all the nutrients that come out of all the maize fields that are upstream, that doesn't work. Uh, yeah, and you can do some simple calculations on that, how wide these riparian zones would have to be to, to deal with all the nutrient load that comes from uh, typical agricultural systems up there. So. Uh, there is a lot of research and yet there is a lot of need to, to apply that. So as, as a general direction, yes, you can often find solutions for soil and water problems within systems with trees that, that don't exist in crops only. And, but it is no panacea and, 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 and you need to understand the processes and you need to understand uh, within the local climate, the local conditions, what is there. 
definitely a very interesting topic for, for research and, and, and quantifying and understanding. Uh, but we need to be careful not, not to expect too much from agroforestry or a few trees in a landscape that is dominated by, by open field agriculture or intensive livestock for that matter. Yeah. Well, thank you for your contribution. Joanna, do you want to add to that? No, nothing to add. All right, thank you. And so that is our last question for today. Uh, we, um, Laura Antoine can answer that question too. Sure, I'll throw in a sentence. So at least specifically in the case of coffee agroforest, um, it can certainly help reduce wastewater runoff to transition to agroforestry systems. Both using less water, somebody's microphone is not, I'm hearing quite a lot of background noise. Um, anyway, I'll try to just talk through it. So it can reduce the amount of water that a farmer needs to use as well as the increased shade cover reduces evaporation from fields. Um, the ability to compost the nutrient cycle on farm reduces the requirements of agricultural inputs, um, especially for those that are producing in organic systems um, and also with pesticides. Uh, using a multi-story agroforestry system allows for more natural defenses against certain pests and diseases um, that when you are dealing with a monoculture plantation, the deck is sort of stacked against you. So at least in the case of coffee, uh, the research suggests that uh, for water conservation efforts, it's, it's the way to go. Yeah, on my side, I don't have much to add to this. Uh, I agree that uh, agroforest system is usually better for pest and disease management because uh, the diversity of insects uh, control the pest by themselves, so they never reach a level. So they are too bad for the coffee if the agroforest is well managed. Uh, and then, of course, for water, as uh, as Laura said, uh, the water uh, is uh, filtered by the, the trees and uh, by the agroforestry system. So so it's, it's cleaner. And then as a problem we still have is the processing part. Like if you still do a wet processing, you still have a lot of uh, water from uh, this processing that goes out and, and kind of uh, pollute the, the water bodies because it's very rich in nutrients. Um, then for this, you have uh, other kind of processes uh, where you can like just dry the, the fruits and avoid using too much water. So this is more like a, like a processing problem that more than the agricultural issues. Yeah. Well, I think that's it. Um, it is time to end our event. Thank you to all of those. If, who I, had can, if I can, sorry, oh, my, sorry, I still see this one question on, on the diversification part that, okay. that okay. is a bit beyond what we looked at. Um, and, and I'd like to use that for a challenge for you all and all of IFSA and all of the current students. Um, We've got last year with the COVID and the lockdown and, and people not being able to go to the field in the way that they expected, etc. Uh, what we found here that that students in Indonesian university that we suddenly had to find new ways for um, their practical periods, etc. And, and, and we asked them to wherever they are, document a couple of things about the impact of this COVID and the lockdown on the agriculture around them. And that turned out to be very interesting. And in a number of places, you find major problems that, well, all the, all the agriculture that feeds the tourism in Bali suddenly found that there is no more demand for any of their products, etc. cetera. Uh, in other parts, we found that, that the demand for local food is increasing, etc. So we find very different effects in different parts of the country, generally, promoting um, or seeing benefits in diversity and seeing that the farmers are locked in in only a single product, they, they may be a real problem. And when they still have options to do something else, they can do pretty well. But I think it is a major opportunity. Uh, it's not an experiment that we would want to do to suddenly stop all the transport and lock people in. But now that it happened, I think we, we should at least um, 
make use of it and, and use that to, to better document yeah, the agility of farmers to deal with it, who, under what condition and, and what type of farming were really hit by it, and under which condition did people actually see new opportunities and they were able to step into that. I think there's, there's, a, there's a, a huge opportunity here um, to document that and, and for an IFSA compare between countries and compare to this and that. So I'd like to, to bring that to you as an opportunity to, to engage with that and, and, and not only see it as a, as, a, as, as, a, as a damage, as a problem, but see it as, as an opportunity as well to understand what, what is sustainability and what type of, of systems are robust and can deal with shocks and where are people locked in, in and can only do one thing and, and when that one thing doesn't work, they are in real trouble. So I'd like to leave that as a suggestion with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. May. Okay, well, it is time to end our event. Thank you to all of those who had the interest in participating in this webinar. A special thanks to Dr. May and Joanna for their presentations. And also a special thanks to Laura and Tuan for their valuable contributions. We hope you have enjoyed our webinar as much as we did. Thank you to all. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye to you all. Good luck. Bye. Good luck.